Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, a weekly broadcast dedicated to helping you make your number by getting your peers to share with you how they are making theirs. Today's topic is brand positioning. My name is Greg Alexander, and I'm the CEO of SBI, and I'm also your host this morning. Joining me today is Kay Keenast. Kay, please introduce yourself to the audience. Well, good morning, Greg, and thanks for inviting me on the podcast. My background is marketing and sales strategy. Uh, I have worked for such companies as Seagate, the Evolt Division, Xerox Enterprise Division, Lexmark, Cisco, and several startups. That's quite a background, so we're thrilled to have you. We think uh, the questions we're getting ready to ask you, you're right in your wheelhouse, and our audience is going to gain much from this. Before I jump into the questions, I just wanted to explain to the sales audience on this call, not the marketing audience, maybe what brand positioning is. So I'm just going to read a quick definition here. So think of this as kind of a problem statement. So customers and prospects sometimes have a hard time articulating their problem and understanding the real cost of the status quo. So to grow revenues faster than the market and the competitors, you need to help them think through their issues, quantify their pain, evaluate their options, and select your solution. Without proper brand positioning and compelling messaging, buyers will not act and you will not grow. So that's our little setup for what brand positioning is. So with all of, Kay, with all of your experience, uh, let's jump into these questions and, and have you help our audience think through this. So the first question would be, what are some of the quote unquote big problems uh, you have run into over your career that you've gone after with brand positioning? Well, interestingly, Greg, those big challenges also lead to big opportunities if we get them right. So what I've found is marketing and sales really still are not working together. Now, let's get into a little detail on that because people will say, oh, we have meetings, we talk to each other, but I'm talking about a coverage map, a joint coverage map. How to integrate the SDRs or whatever you call the telesales arm and demand gen. Each leads to confusion by customers and lost time and money if this all does not work optimally together. So let me just dig a little into that coverage map scenario. That means jointly developing so marketing supports the right customers. And data now can inform both sales and marketing about lookalike prospects, meaning those that look alike your best customers. Another issue is once an, an MQL is provided to the let's call it the SDR, what happens next? SDR will contact the prospect typically five to seven times, both with emails and calls. But at the same time, marketing's doing the same thing to those prospects at likely the very same time. So think about what the customer might be thinking when that's happening. Mm -hmm. And then once demand generation, what is that criteria? How do we know when the handoff should take place? Sales needs to identify what their ideal prospect is. It needs to be informed by data. And then marketing follows through with these are the folks that we're jointly uh, working with to, to create a customer. And what is the expectation for named accounts? Marketing is sending all these messages out. Is that what the named account reps really want them to do? How do you have a plan? Marketing's call, calling that account-based marketing now, but sales has been doing it for years. And then how do you determine the quota for sales and marketing? So that's an awful lot in that bucket, um, Greg, of opportunity. Yeah, it is an awful lot in the bucket. And, you know, the... The path that you took that answer raises some really interesting questions around coverage maps. You know, today's show is is about positioning the brand, and I and I started off the question around the big problem. And if I'm interpreting your answer correctly, 
you know, there's, there's a problem that your target customer is having and your product or solution solves that problem. It's one of the solutions that solves that problem. And we as marketers and sales leaders are trying to position that solution as the best one in the eyes of the customer. And sometimes we frustrate the customer because sales and marketing isn't working well together and there's all these interactions happening, whether it's in named accounts or little accounts in North American accounts or international accounts, it doesn't matter. We're, we're, coord we're trying to coordinate this communication, both from sales and marketing, in such a way that it's a consistent message and it's a message that... Is that is exactly right. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a real challenge that's going on these days. And you're right. I mean, you, know, you brought up this term, account-based marketing, and it seems to be the new buzzword. It's, it's, you know, what's the old saying? Stick around long enough and everything becomes new again. <laughs> well, sales has been doing it for years. Yeah. How about yeah, that? Yeah. They've always had target accounts. All right. So this challenge of getting sales and marketing to work well together, to position the brand through all the different communication channels correctly to the customer. So in your mind, which takes me to my second question is, you know, what are the drivers that causes that problem? Well, if we look at it, we've got marketing automation tools, and I don't care which one you're using, but then you've got the CRM that sales is typically responsible for. And then there's no clearly defined joint goals, objectives, or processes when the two are using these tools plus the web. The web flies into this, and this causes distrust between sales and marketing. You know, I've heard it in many different forms on both sides. So add to that social media growth mm -hmm. and now a new, ent a new entity into the same customer mix and the social selling – and then realizing both sales and marketing now have a revenue number of some sort. So all of those things lead to the, the distrust that the two organizations have of each other. Mm -hmm. and, and how does that manifest itself to customers and prospects? I mean, how does it frustrate uh, the customers and the prospects? Well, think about it. If you were the customer and you had marketing contacting you, SDRs contacting you and the direct sales force contacting you, often with disparate selling messages. Mm. So I've heard customers and prospects say that the organization doesn't have its act together. That's your first clue that they're getting different messaging from different people. And other different branding can be used, particularly if you're in a region. I've had an example of people changing the color of the logo, and that's extremely confusing mm. to customers. Mm. So if we look at what I believe we would, might all perceive as what organizations need and want is to look like the same organization globally. Uh, there needs to be continuity between the regions for both support and the sale and service of those solutions. So it doesn't matter if the customer is headquartered in Europe, they expect the same offerings and support in the US or in APAC. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think we're getting great clarity around the problem um, and the need for sales and marketing <clears throat> to work well together. I think the problem has become heightened, as we're hearing from Kay this morning, because of all these new channels, social media channels, uh, advanced websites, mobile, uh, the list goes on and on. So the status quo situation that uh, our customers and prospects find themselves in is uh, we're confusing them because we're not on message, so to speak, and the customer doesn't have the same experience um, when they're engaging with your brand through all of the different channels. Um, did that accurately capture what you're trying to say, Kay? It really does. And I think it's heightened because everything has become digital. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And everything is so fast and you can take a digital message and distort it, lickety split. And uh, it's like the old game of telephone when we were kids. By the time the message gets to the customer, you don't even recognize it. 
Exactly. All right. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but before we do, I want to let our audience know that we just released Hot Off the Presses, our annual workbook for 2017, titled How to Make Your Number in 2017. It was written for executive leadership teams inside of companies with aggressive, maybe even impossible, revenue growth targets who have a lot on the line and don't have a lot of time to waste. So if you're heading into your 2017 planning process, you're figuring out things like headcount numbers and revenue goals, et cetera, you're gonna to wanna to read this because it's gonna increase the probability of you making your number. So you can get a copy at sbi.tips forward slash 2017 workbook. So this is the SBI podcast. We'll be back in a sec. Making your number is hard. Your problems are complex. Complex problems need complex solutions. Introducing the SBI Magazine. Read in-depth stories written by award-winning journalists about how your peers have overcome their problems to make the numbers. When you need more than a tweet, social post, or blog article, turn to the SBI Magazine. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com to subscribe. Welcome back, crew. You are listening to the SBI Podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Alexander, and today's guest is Kay Keenast. And today's topic is brand positioning. So let's jump back into the questions. So Kay, we, we talked in the first segment about the problem, and you, as a positive optimist, positioned it as an opportunity. So <laughs> what is the opportunity provided to us, um, to uh, marketing leaders and sales leaders, and how can we improve the customer experience if we get our act together around this uh, brand positioning concept? Well, brand positioning, as you defined, is what we say about and to our customers, what we say about our company and our solution to our customers. So if we can do a joint go-to-market plan versus the way sales and marketing goes to market separately today, and let me explain more in detail by what I mean about that. Okay. So right now, sales ops will come with, these are the target customers, here's how we're going to go to market with those customers, here's the territory, and so on. On the other side, marketing is creating a list of, here are the targets, here is the demand gen plan, here is the social media plan, and on and on and on. And it's, it's two separate organizations trying to put together very disparate plans. And I'm suggesting, and I know that it's radical, that we have a plan with multiple components that sales and marketing can both support. That might even mean that we have to look at our organization and say maybe having these two disparate planning groups is not the way to go. But what we know is that there need to be very meaty weekly, biweekly meetings around those key performance indicators. And in this case, if we all look at revenue as that major key performance indicator, how are we doing both sales and marketing and what needs to change before it becomes a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is a radical idea. It's a great idea. Um, current state is described like we described in segment one. This represents kind of an ideal state, right? So one plan jointly created by one team. Um, how do we go from our problematic status quo, so to speak, to this opportunity-filled future? Well, I think this is going to take some work, and it'll be different for every organization, but it's a phased approach. It's not a let's do a forklift upgrade here, and everybody's thrown in a bucket, and here's what you do, and here's what you do. So prioritizing what's most important first. For example, the joint coverage map. Everybody's going to work with this set of accounts because this is where we have coverage, and that's where marketing will send messages. And these are the messages. So I think that gets, that gets to the heart of the problem, but it may be different for different companies. So working that plan together in a coordinated fashion and in phases 
makes sense to me. And that would include neither group, and that would be marketing, sales, IT, uh, buying solutions, and not giving access to those tools to other departments, because then they don't all have the same information. Okay. So that's a path forward. I like that. Um, what do you say to the skeptic in the audience who says, hey, that's too much work. It's never going to happen. I mean, what's the cost of, you know, quote, doing nothing in this area? You know, I was at an IDG conference this last month, and their research indicates that a third of the Fortune 2000 companies will, will be gone within the next three years. Now, that's very scary information. But what they're saying is the pace of digitization and the disparity between the organizations will cause a chasm and customers will not buy. Mm. So the cost of doing nothing is pretty scary to me. Mm -hmm. So give me that stat again. They said a third of the Global 2000 won't exist in three years? That's right. Jeez. So now, it, that's scary. Yeah, it is I very mean, scary. I mean, I thought, what in the world? But it's the pace of information. It's the way the customers go about looking at different sources now. They have access to all the information about your solutions, your competitors, your costs. They have everything. So that is a fast pace that we all have to get used to thinking about. Yep. They do their research. They tell you who they're going to entertain, the top three. It's done at that point. Mm -hmm. All right. What, what do we say to a marketing leader who, who might not want to walk into the CEO's office and say, hey, if we don't do this, we're going to be out of business in three years, according to IDG? I mean, that, it's so scary, and, and I'm sure it's valid. It's so, so scary that it might not be believable. So is there a way that you can quantify the cost of doing nothing in your own shop? Any ideas for the audience on how to do that? Yeah, I would look at revenue and margins. Mm -hmm. If revenue and margins are continuing to decline or you can't get a foothold with a new solution, then that calls for some change. Because people put these solutions together. Normally, a lot of money is spent doing that, and a lot of people are involved doing it, including customers. So not being able to get a foothold or sell is not just the salesperson's problem. It's marketing's problems. It's everyone's problem in the organization. Yep. Okay. I know we tend to point fingers about what's the problem, but um, we all need to think about how we solve it together. I mean, nothing will unify sales and marketing more than talking about revenue and margins, right? Without either of those two things, a company doesn't exist, and maybe you become one of those a company in that third that might go away inside of three years. So that, that's great advice. All right, here's something of value to the audience. SBI's new app and website allows you to create an account and personalize your experience. Select how often you want to receive content from us, in what format, do you want text, audio, video, and on what topic. So you can download the SBI app from Apple's App Store. You can go to our new website at salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash register. We have one more segment with Kay right after the break, so stick around, we'll see you in a second. Do you have too many things to do and not enough time to do them? Is finding time to learn best practices almost impossible? The SBI podcast is your solution. Turn time spent exercising, commuting, and traveling into productive learning time with a subscription to the SBI podcast. SBI podcast listeners get unique insight into real world sales and marketing issues through interviews with your industry peers every week. Find us on iTunes by searching for Sales Benchmark Index Podcast and subscribe today. Okay, this is our last segment with Kay Keenast. Let's get back to the questions. So let's talk about the competition and understanding the other options available to customers and prospects to solve their problems. So as we talked earlier in the show, we discussed how brand positioning um, needs to be consistent across channel and sales and marketing needs to be sending a unified message to the customers so that we reduce confusion regardless of the channel. 
When you look at the competition and they're communicated to those same customers about their solutions to their problems, um, Kay, in your opinion, do, do the competitors have their act together? And is this an area where we have to play catch up? Or are most companies struggling with this and this represents an area where we can leapfrog the competition? I think you can leapfrog the competition, Greg, because you're going to look at the customer and the customer's infrastructure and determine how you can help them optimally, optimally meet their goals within their infrastructure versus, hey, I got this thing to sell and I got it, you got to buy this from me. So if you reverse this, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about it, first you're looking at how you're going to solve a problem within the customer infrastructure, and they're all different. So understanding what that really looks like becomes the first measure. Then secondly, how does your solution fit and what will it do for them? And I think we forget that all of our solutions fit in an infrastructure and some things work and some things don't work well. Mm -hmm. But being honest about it is really important. So I'll give an example of one of the execs at Oracle selling a solution. He approaches it in a manner of this is how it works. Here's how it'll work in your organization. Here's what it won't do. It's not going to do the following three things. And he'll know going in if that's really important to them. So he's honest, he's straightforward, he knows where it works and where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing to me. Mm -hmm. And what's distinctive about that in your view is that he was honest about what it won't do? That's right. Yeah. And with somebody who's selling to you in that way, um, that elevates their credibility in your eyes? It does, because right now this trust me, it'll work message won't work because we have sales, marketing, IT, product management and development have all told customers it'll do, that the solution will do things. And then we have to go and recode something or customize it. That only exacerbates the solution when we get to the next rev. Now the customer has to do that custom, you know, coding again. And so they're very skeptical about what we say to them. Mm -hmm. They want to prove it up. They want you to show them. Yep. Okay, so now I'm a customer and I'm looking at these alternatives and you've described to me, you know, what your product does and what it doesn't do. And in the spirit of today's topic, brand positioning, uh, I now ask you as a customer, you're the vendor, to compare and contrast your solution to the competition. So how do you describe how the competition might not solve the problem in such a way that is uh, effective yet politically correct? <laughs> well, that's gonna be hard, but it always has to be done. So one of the things we did at Seagate Evolve is have product marketing, product management not do the typical grid, it has these benefits, it has these functions, the feature function benefit thing, but to actually help profile the infrastructure that the solution optimally worked in, ours versus competitors. And that helped all of us understand better what to say to the customer. And then I'll tell you that there was a study done um, globally and it was a particularly good study by one of the um, industry analysts that identified if you're, all the features, functions, benefits, everything was equal, and we know that that's not normally true in the industry. There's always something unique about each of the solutions. What, how would someone choose? And the answer globally came back on the brand. Hmm. What we believe about your brand, what we believe about the way you take care of your customers, the way you go to market together, um, and your service and support. It's what they believe that the brand stands for. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of this very hard. Yep. 
It's a great way to conclude our show. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time, but you know, today's topic was about brand positioning, and you just brought that home very nicely by citing a study that you know, decision makers that are making these purchase decisions, when asked why they buy, they buy based on the brand, um, not necessarily feature benefit, but on who you are, how you're going to serve me, what your brand promises, and your brand proof points. So, Kay, I want to thank you for your time today. It was really an enlightening conversation, and I appreciate you uh, giving back to our community and contributing to the um, collective knowledge base. You're very welcome. Okay. And I want to thank you, the SBI audience, for tuning in. If you want to learn more about brand positioning and all the other emerging best practices top leaders are deploying to make their numbers, go to salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash register and create an account, and we'll send you wonderful information like this interview. But until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.